Good morning to our viewers here in Nigeria and around the world. I am Bosun Amofaye on behalf of Frontier Africa Reports. I have a privilege and honor uh, to bring everyone to this very important conversation. Today, June 3rd, 2020, the, uh, marks the sixth anniversary of the resumption in office of Godwin Emefele as the Central Bank Governor uh, for Nigeria. That was a very uh, in 2014, six years down the line, we're doing a very special edition focusing on the sixth anniversary and the monetary policy footprints of this uh, administration at the Central Bank of Nigeria. My panelists, let me quickly introduce them from the um, to the top uh, left of the your TV screen. Uh, your monitoring Ali Khan Sachu is the CEO and founder of Rich Frontiers Management. is based in Nairobi, Kenya. Good morning. It's good to have you with us on the program this morning, Ali. And uh, just to my immediate uh, um, right on your table screen is Philip Gila Yusuf. He is the director in charge of uh, development finance at the Central Bank of Nigeria. Thank you, Mr. Yusuf. It's good to have you on the show. Good morning, Mr. Mofai. And thank you. And just uh, to the bottom uh, left is Dr. Hassan uh, Mahmoud, who used to be the director in charge of the FSS at the Central Bank, now in charge, director in charge of monetary policy at the Central Bank of Nigeria. Dr. Mahmoud, good morning. It's good to have you on this special edition. Good morning. It's nice to be here. Thank you. And directly under my uh, video window there is uh, the chairman of Sunu Assurance Nigeria PLC, an economist and the former chairman of Nigeria Economic Summit Group, Mr. Buka Kerry. Good morning, Mr. Kerry. It's good to see you on the show. Good morning, Boston. Thank you. Thank you. We expect, thank you. We expect Dr. Bungo Adi, who is a senior faculty of economics at the Lagos Business School, to join us within the hour of this presentation. So let's get the show started. Uh, let me give you a very quick rundown of a very brief rundown of Godwin Emefele, the governor of the Central Bank, a very quiet, unassuming individual who was announced uh, by the former. Uh, a president, middle class president, Dr. Goodluck Jonathan, as the new central bank governor. How much about um, um, uh, Good Godwin and Mefele did we know as he took office in 2014, June the 3rd? Of course, he was a banker with about 26 years' experience in commercial banking. Uh, of course, now he's in his second uh, term as the governor of the central bank for the next five years. Uh, he was a lecturer in finance and insurance. But in terms of education, uh, I believe that and you see that uh, Godine Mefele uh, has uh, a bit of a, he studied uh, banking and finance at the University of Nigeria, Unsuka, that's in Southeast Nigeria. So was an alumnus of the Stanford University, Harvard and the Wortham Graduate School of Business. Uh, Mefele also uh, studied, done courses in negotiation, leading change and strategy critical thinking, among others. So this is just about uh, Godin Emefile when he took office. So we want to start this conversation about how much of uh, Mr. Emefile's background um, has been brought to bear uh, with what he's done so far at the Central Bank of Nigeria. So let me ask you first, Dr. Um, um, Mahmoud, you've worked with him over the last couple of years. So looking at his uh, his uh, antecedents, his experience in, in banking and all of that, how much of it, how much of him would you say about his competencies and ability to lead this very critical organization over the last six years? Dr. Mamou. Thank you very much. I think the most important uh, you know, um, advantage that uh, Mr. Gordon Emefele has is that he was coming in from the banking sector. Uh, as you well know, the, the transmission or the implementation of monetary policy is critically through the banking system because that is the sector we have control over. And since he is a veteran in that side, he was an MD of, uh, of Zenit Bank before then, he had a long career in the bank. So he knows the functioning and the operation of the bank and he knows the transmission mechanism of that banking system. So issues relating to liquidity management, issues relating to credit extension to the real sectors, to the financial inclusion initiatives were just hands-on for him because he is already dealing with the operators at the, at the topmost level and the interaction at that level was, was kind of seamless. So that was a big advantage for us at the central bank and uh, it, it also enables the bank to be able to 
effectively implement its policies. Particularly, you know, not everything that can be done through regulatory fiat and stuff, there are issues of moral situations that you have to come in, like great extension. Those are supposed to be business, you know, initiatives of the bank, and we're not supposed to micromanage banks in any way. However, we're supposed to make sure that the banks are effectively competitive, transparent, and they're not distorting others that are played into the game. So for having that top position in the banking system, having his friends in that system was 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 uh, was uh, enables him to easily you know navigate that sphere and get things done the right way. I think that was that was a big plus for him. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you, Dr. Mahmoud, for raising the curtain on this uh, conversation. But let me ask uh, uh, Kerry Booker. Uh, uh, you were at that time at the NESG in 2014 when uh, Gordon took over. Of course, this is not the first time. He wasn't the first commercial banking uh, managing director to head uh, the central bank, the immediate past uh, governor of the central bank, uh, 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 Lamido Senussi, uh, the former emir of uh, Kano, and another Senussi way back in 2000, around the year 2000. Uh, another Senussi, Dr. Senussi, Joseph Senussi was also uh, a central bank, uh, uh, sorry, a commercial bank. A managing director. So, what are your thoughts over the last six years in summary about uh, uh, Godwin Emefele? Um, uh, Mr. Emefele's um, uh, tenure has been, um, well, uh, within, uh, I believe, within the first two years of his uh, assumption of duties, um, he was faced with, um, with, a, with, a, with a serious recession that the country went into. So, I do remember that he came in June of 2014, by mid-2016, we've had a major shock to the economy. And uh, I think he had his responses quite, um, quite unorthodox and unusual. And uh, some of us on the sidelines have critiqued it, but he actually came, it came out and proven to the market, especially when it comes to some of the FX interventions he had done, that they were the right things to do, hindsight. Of course, that may actually have to do with the fact that he was an academic before he even went into the banking sector. Uh, and then in the banking sector, he had seen uh, and tested all the uh, nuances of, 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 of the issues from the perspective of a manager running uh, an enterprise. But now it is actually the whole kit and caboodle that uh, he was faced with. So, and of course, uh, a lot of people and analysts would say that the interventionist posture was not the right thing. But looking at our economy, looking at where we are in terms of the developmental stage, he had to actually take the bulls by the horn to ensure that certain things get done. And if he left it to the other players, meaning the commercial banks, uh, it may not happen in the manner in which some of his interventions have. So essentially, uh, giving, given the fact that in the first two years of his tenure, he was faced with that uh, challenge. And then, of course, the first year of his second uh, term, uh, the, the pandemic, which actually is not uh, anybody's, um, uh, um, it is not the fault of anyone, but it has a, um, you know, a devastating effect on the entire global economy. And of course, all central banks have been responding in uh, the way and manner, which the central bank governor did, uh, was it yesterday or day before yesterday, in terms of easing uh, and, and having an expansionary posture. It is needed, it is critical, but at this time, things like inflation shouldn't even be a factor. We should look at, you know, trying to basically goose the economy so that things would work. And I think for those uh, sorts of uh, responses, um, I will um, say that Mr. Emefale had done a wonderful job uh, with the circumstances he has faced as the central bank governor. Uh, thank you, uh, Buka Kiari. L let me ask, uh, uh, before I go there, let me just welcome uh, uh, our final panelist, Bungo Adi. Dr. Bungo Adi is a senior uh, faculty of, of economics at Lagos Business School. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Adi, for coming through on the on the show. Thank you very much, Boston, for having me here. A quick one. Let, let me ask uh, Ali. Why is it such a very important discussion? And everybody try to scratch their head, wrap their own heads around it when it is time to choose a new central bank governor. 
Why are they very important in economic, finance, and markets discussion? Um, uh, and when they come in with policies, like in Kenya, I'm sure there's been a lot of issues around the central bank and the government, whether that's a cap interest rate for banks and what have you. So in, in, in the, within the Kenyan environment, which is uh, the largest economy, east coast of the African continent, give us about a minute here, uh, the, your perspectives on why central banks are important when we talk about monetary policy, developing an economy, and sometimes going the unorthodox path at times like this. And just quickly, if I can too compliment uh, uh, Mr. Emifili, I think partly, you know, a central banker is faced with market conditions, and I don't think you could describe more complex, more volatile market conditions than the central bank governor in Nigeria faced over the last few years. I, for one, was a skeptic with the foreign exchange policy, but I think given the hand he was dealt, he played it with finesse, and I have to compliment him. He has managed that economy in a way I would not have expected another central banker to manage. And therefore, when you look at it that way, he has been really an artiste in handling a really, really fiendishly difficult hand. With respect to the importance of the central bank governor in any economy today, Boasson, look at the world as we find it. It's become more and more complex economically We've got more and more of a conflict between populist policy making and orthodox central banking. We've got this sort of much more complex environment in which a central banker has to operate within than ever before. And I think, therefore, you need an intellectual, you need a market practitioner, and you need somebody who can come across and make their point to the public. It's no longer an ivory tower job. You've got to be communicating. So it's, it's a multi-dimensional task now. And I think that's why you've seen the profile of central bankers before you would not see them today. They're out there, they're talking, they're explaining, um, they're involved in the real economy. It's not just about setting monetary policy. And that's why I think the importance of that role within any economy has become really, really critical. And somewhere like Kenya as well, we've got uh, Dr. Jirogi, who is a, a very accomplished central bank governor, who had to fight um, a situations which he did not believe in. Uh, he did not believe in interest rate capping. And he had, for, for a long time, he had to persuade everybody around that before he could get it reformed. So that is one example. And I think, you know, he has been another example of somebody who sought to communicate and deal with the public in all, in all respects. So, look, it's a really complicated task. And I, for one, really compliment uh, your governor because I think he handled a really difficult hand. It was like playing cards with four twos. And he's done it. And that is really remarkable. <laughs> Thank you so much. It's like uh, our fighting. In the, in the gladiatorial Roman arena, with one hand tied behind your back and your weapons on the your weapon on the ground. But let's get into some uh, thematic about the, about some of the thematic themes about the footprint uh, that uh, Godwin Emefele has uh, left within the last six years. So uh, look at it on the on the side of the broad economy. This was someone who came through uh, the front door on the economy side with the 41 items, for example, and then he he rolled out those very uh, unpopular and very highly controversial items. Uh, that was 41 items down. They've got about 43, 45 now. He supported the administration's decision to close the land borders in August of last year. Uh, he's also uh, intervened significantly through the monetary policy in the agri sector, cottons, textiles, palm oil, rice, and, and, and others. So let me ask the, uh, the um, director, in charge of the um, uh, development finance, uh, Philip Yusuf, uh, about his thoughts about uh, the central bank's monetary policies under Godin and Mefele over the last six years in terms of development finance, some of which some folks say the central bank has no business being in the business of those interventions in critical sectors. Thank you, um, Mr. Mofaya. And the numbers speak for themselves. Um, if you look at our food import bill, um, it's reduced when Mr. Mefile took over in 2014. 
our food import bill was $3.2 billion a year. As we speak, that has come down to about um, $500, $500 million every year. That is significant. Um, And you can imagine the broader transmission um, to the economy. I'll give you another example. Rice yields, um, when he took over, was about one, one and a half tons per hectare. As we speak today, we are doing between four and five tons per hectare. That's another fact. We have also started a program, the Anko Bora program, which Mr. MFLA conceived and started. We financed over 1.7 million farmers. You can imagine this, the, the, the quite a significant number, and they're cultivating over 1.8 million hectares around the country. So as we speak today, we are self-sustaining for, for various commodities like rice, like um, wheat, um, quite a couple of them. We are looking long-term on those that have longer gestation periods, like oil palm. We intend to be self-sustaining by 2023 on, on that. On the manufacturing side, Mr. Emifili has been quite passionate about um, you know, manufacturing. He spent about 26 years with Zenit. He, he understands the, the major players in, in that vertical sector. And he has intervened. There's a specific um, real sector facility we have for them. In the last um, four or five years of his um, tenure, we financed over 100 greenfield uh, projects. And those have brought in about um, 50, 60,000 direct, direct jobs. So it's quite, um, he, he, for me, he's a developmental governor. He's a hybrid between uh, Volca uh, and, and Greenspan. He's also a crisis manager. And uh, Mr. Kerry talked about um, when he took over and, you know, had the, um, the, the FX crisis and the unorthodox policies that, uh, that he used. If you look at before the COVID actually hit uh, Nigeria, we were fast enough to have ruled out um, policies. You, you remember the 50 billion targeted facilities at MSMEs and also the 100 billion for, for, for healthcare. So in the last uh, six years, um, he's been, for me, a developmental governor and the facts are are there for everyone to see. I was speaking with someone yesterday and I said, look, how does your, 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 your shopping basket look like? Six years ago, if you had gone to one of the major stores and you had come out, I can bet you 50, 60% of the items in that shopping basket are foreign uh, products. But as you speak today, 99% of them are quite local products. And you can imagine the value add that we have um, on the economy. And that's quite significant. Okay, so um, a very quick one. You have seen um, uh, issues around, but, but let me quickly ask uh, Bungu Adi uh, this about the policy footprints of the Godwin Emifili on the economy side. Uh, Bungu Adi, uh, are we in on this side, on this conversation here? Oh, okay, well, um, I think it's been uh, mentioned by other colleagues uh, before I start. Good morning, everyone, and uh, thanks for having me join you uh, on this conversation this morning. Um, yes, I like uh, what um, um, like, uh, Ali Khan said about the role of the central bank, uh, bank or the central banker today. You know, so it's not just uh, a policy setting uh, role uh, meant only for the ivory tower academicians. So it requires someone who is uh, who has his foot firmly in the market, who has a very firm grip of the market realities. So a practitioner in that sense. So, and we've seen that uh, uh, with uh, Mr. MFLA in the way he has managed the economy. So, um, because of that, he has come under attack, especially from most uh, theoretical economists in Nigeria, uh, for what they call, uh, you know, his unconventional monetary policy stance, uh, where he has uh, used the monetary policy or the central bank to intervene in so many development and critical development sectors of the economy. So, we've seen him, you know, in that sectoral focus. So, but the thing is that uh, when you look at the coordination of the economy, some people are still not sure that uh, the sectoral, you know, based intervention uh, work uh, optimally for the economy because, uh, you know, there are a lot of uh, complementarities within the economic uh, setting. Uh, so, it's, it's, a, it's, it's actually a system such that what happens in one sector affects the other sectors. So, when you begin to intervene in some critical sectors without intervening in some other sector that have very... Uh, very strong linkage with uh, such, then that becomes a very uh, big problem. So that's some of the things we are seeing. But then in terms of uh, his uh, impact, his footprint in sectors, I think it's beginning to be felt in agriculture, uh, with respect to SMEs, uh, even in manufacturing and other sectors. I think he has done um, what people have seen to, you know, he has tried to um, introduce some kind of activism in those areas 
But then um, uh, we are not yet, uh, I think, uh, in a position to begin to see the impact of those uh, interventions yet, because uh, they are not yet being felt at the economy-wide uh, level. Uh, thank you. Let us talk about the finance and market as far as the policy footprints of uh, Godin and Mifili uh, have been over the last six years. Dr. Mahmoud, uh, the, the governor, uh, I want to be very careful here, most likely have made a lot of uh, a number of enemies when you talk about his uh, policies that he led at the central bank regarding chasing smugglers, uh, locking up their accounts in the, in the in commercial uh, uh, banks. Uh, he, he, he also perhaps made uh, a rough with a lot of feathers, as it were in the banking sector when it comes to FX, with investors who want their money now uh, and all of that, they want to uh, expect <coughs> their funds from Nigeria, exchange rate, devaluation, it keeps battling it. This is a governor who believes that he's very bullish on, uh, on market stability and bearish on inflation. So this is your uh, forte. You are coming through from FSS into monetary policy, Dr. Mahmoud. So the last six years, how tough has it been? And do you believe or do you think these policies uh, were right, and they, are they still uh, very right and correct for the future? Yeah, I, 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 I will build on what uh, Dr. Kerry just mentioned. You see, the environment we are operating in, and it's not unique to the monetary authorities, it's the fiscal authorities are also having a taste of, of theirs. The, the kind of distortions, fundamental distortions in the economy will require unique skills, unique channels for you to be able to achieve your objectives. However, those channels or those, those uh, tools that you're going to use or techniques must be transparent, acceptable, and well communicated. And I, I think that is what uh, uh, Mr. Emefele is battling with. This, 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 these, are, these are terrains that are extremely rough. So you need, you know, super pole tires to be able to run through those rough terrains. And, and what we have seen, and like most people said, oh, there are unconventional monetary policy tools, unconventional approaches to, to the environment itself is unconventional. So standard <laughs> microeconomic assumptions, standard microeconomic economic theories and a priori conditions are not even prevalent. So you have to use some unique idiosyncratic or, or, or country-specific approaches to address some of this. And that is principally what has been happening. And we are seeing the results. We are seeing the results. And, and even when you look at the global uh, environment, it is everywhere. The United States is going unconventional. The UK, the Europe, they are all using unconventional monetary policy tools. But because the environment now has significantly changed, there's nothing wrong in following, definitely, your fundamentals will be based on sound microeconomic theories and already established preconditions for policy tools to, 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 to be implemented. So that is given. However, the way you navigate your terrain is unique to you. And that's, when, that's why when you say your best skill or your best tool here in Nigeria is your ability to understand the economy. They will say to the fiscal authorities, the president needs to see presidents are come to pass. I don't know it was this bad. I didn't know it was this bad. You need to understand the economy perfectly so that you can be able to effectively pass through your transmission mechanism. If you don't have that, 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 uh, that uh, narratives at your thumbprint, then you'll be, doing, you'll be doing policies that are not impacting on the economy. So mm. we know our weakest links. We know the supply rigidities. We know the payment system infrastructure deficit. We know all that. So you need to find the channel. I will not say the market failed, but the market has a lot of distortions, a lot of noises. So you need to be able to silence those noises so you can navigate through those terrain. And we are seeing the results. And in every sector of the economy, we are seeing that impact coming up. Uh, uh, I just Dr. gave some of those. Uh, yeah, go Dr. ahead. Dr. The, 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 the World Bank, the IMF, the rating agencies keep telling the central bank to change its position on foreign exchange system. Today, yeah. it looks like the central bank is not adhering to that. What more needs to be done? What to, to be done? What do you think the World Bank and other agencies and other market participants want to see in Nigeria's FX market in terms of our policy for our, uh, policy framework is concerned or actions that need to be taken? The, the, the critical thing or the most important thing that is that, that the IMF or all these multilateral institutions are, are, are slammering on is the fact that we have a multiple exchange rate regime. 
and that has been brought in arbitrages, uh, distortions, noise into the market. It is not kind of showing that you are, you, you are operating on the true value of the Naira. There's, there's it's supposed to be an invisible hand demand and supply thing, but no, there's a visible hand touching that. That is, that is, that is understood. The critical thing is that what is the structure of your own economy? What are the parameters that you need to use? And what are the tools that you have? So you also, you also have to look at those options. You know, what are the tools that you have? The person that has a super Ferrari to travel from here to Kaduna is the person that has a Caterpillar to travel to Kaduna. So you need to understand what are the tools in your hand, what is the structure of your economy. So you need to navigate that to be able to achieve. Don't, don't forget that the most important is how do you achieve your mandate or how do you get to your end goal. I agree, yes, there are, there, are, there are distortions you see in the market. However, given the things that you have put in place, we, we've been saying this, and many people have said it, that since they were born, including those that are 60 years old now, they've been saying diversify the economy, diversify the economy, and they keep asking the question, what does this diversification really mean? Then Central Bank of India cannot diversify the economy. Central Bank of India can just be a catalyst to the diversification of the economy. Those are major structural issues that are not short term. Don't forget that also central bank monetary policy tools are temporary short-term tools, you know, to complement what the fiscal, fiscal, fiscal authority drive the economy. They give the inflation rate, they give the growth rate, they give from the MPTF uh, uh, medium term. Ours is to how do we use our, our monetary aggregate approach to manage the liquidity sufficient for price stability to drive the sustainable growth we're, we're looking at. So looking at the exchange, number one, We've also said this, and researchers have shown that the pass through from exchange rate to domestic prices is extremely high. So, why they are there, you are seeing side, and then also note that the source of supply for the exchange rate is extremely limited. Mm. So, what we can manage as central bank is demand. We can manage supply. So, when the supply is shrinking, and the, the power muscle we have to manage exchange rate is our reserve. Don't forget that a substantial part of the funds coming in from government is monetized. Government has the Naira. So the bulk of what we have in our research, which the international investors are looking at, and it's important that we look at that part of, because of the financing deficit we have, we cannot shy away from what the international or foreign investors are looking at in our economy, because that is what is supporting our capital market, that is what is supporting our money market. It is very, it's also supporting the fiscal authority. We are taking all these loans and the IMF and all this stuff, is because they, they will definitely appraise your economy before they give those facilities. So it is important we also look at that side of the, 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 the equation. While we are looking at the domestic side of the equation, we have the external side that are supposed to support our financing gap inside the code infrastructure and also in terms of the real sector of the economy. So why you need the multiple objectives that you have also means that you have to be extremely flexible in your approach to adopt those uh, we know of the, the, the three musketeers who can hold interest rate, exchange rate, and stuff. But in certain environments, we have to see which ones, what tools do you have. And that's, that's why I gave you the example of the Caterpillar and the Ferrari. You have to be, know that the Caterpillar cannot run at uh, 120 kilometers per hour to go to Kaduna. Mm. However, it has big tires that can go through the mods and go through the valleys to get to Kaduna. So it is important we have those idiosyncratic factors and features and characteristics of the economy in the implementation of our policy. What is key is, is, is it transparent? Is it, is it, is it on a play, is this on a, you know, a clear, or what do you call it, an equal playing field? Is the competition, competitiveness of it very efficient? That is what is important. So we will concentrate on having liquidity in the market. The i &E window is, is more or less in demand and supply driven substantially. That is the biggest part of the, 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 the market where you see transactions taking place at the of official window is more or less for government uh, transactions. The BD side is also supporting some small uh, scale activities, travels, and stuff like that. So if you don't have that bucket, you expect a small SME that is doing one small business of twenty thousand dollars to come to the interbank market and 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 look for fifty or thirty thousand dollars as against someone that's looking for five ten million dollars. So we created those buckets so that those targeted sectors can move. These are things that seamlessly will fall into, will fall into shape at the end of it, and you will see the convergence of, which we already seen the convergence of the rate in the market. Dr. Dr. Mahmoud, thank you. Well said. Let me uh, ask uh, 
uh, to other non central bank uh, panelists to weigh in on some of the things you've said. Uh, uh, Booker Kerry, um, some folks believe that, yes, the last um, uh, monetary policy decision to uh, lower interest rates, headline interest rate by 100 basis points was good. Some felt it should have been done a bit much earlier to support the economy. Uh, what's your take? Uh, Dr. Mahmoud has spoken to FX, uh, demand, supply, and pricing metrics. But when we look at interest rates as a catalyst for economic growth, where we're trying to look at inflation, on the other hand, what's your take about the path that Godin Emefile and his team at the Central Bank have trodden over the last six years? Um, uh, now, I'm going to make a disclosure. I am not an economist per se. So, um, but, but, but having said that, uh, the issue of trilemma is still um, a, a big problem. You cannot juggle all three things at the same time, meaning uh, exchange rate, inflation, and interest rate rates. But I'm one of the proponents um, of, of, of reduction of the, of the, of the um, monetary policy rate. Uh, and I've been calling for it for quite a while, uh, especially once this pandemic started. The, the thing that I actually wanted to, the reason why I have that belief is not necessarily that of, um, you know, pushing, when you push a balloon on one side, it will bulge on the other. So naturally there would be an inflationary pressure. But when the economy is shut down, inflation may not, inflation would actually bound to come, especially when you look at the way we produce food in Nigeria and the way we distribute it. Uh, so, for example, I have a farm where things are rotting right now because I can't evacuate it. Um, and they, so when you look at it, the problem is not that of uh, production per se, but it is that of the logistics of distribution in certain uh, aspects of inflation. So essentially, by goosing the economy, by cutting interest rates, you may put in a bit of liquidity. And I do understand the problem the central bank, bank governor is faced with. Give more Naira in Nigeria, it will begin to chase Apex. And I do understand that argument. So it is a major issue. However, if it is targeted at SMEs and all of that, then we may begin to see that at the base of the economic producers, meaning the small, medium scale enterprises, who actually are in the hundreds of thousands, they can make an impact that at the end of the day would be far greater. So, but, but of course, when one looks at it from the theoretical point of view, it is a dangerous thing. So yeah, cut it, cut the interest rate, and then begin to monitor very closely how things are evolving. If it doesn't make sense, you can tighten a bit. However, at this time, uh, in the life of this unusual and unorthodox economy, uh, certain unorthodox measures need to take place. And this is, I believe, what the Central Bank uh, Monetary Policy Committee must have considered. I haven't read the minutes. I don't believe it has come out yet. But, but I do believe that uh, the, the logic behind it makes sense to me uh, because I have been calling for it for quite a while. Thank, thank you, uh, uh, Booker. Uh, uh, Dr. Adi, uh, Philip Yusuf uh, spoke a little bit earlier about developing finance and those critical interventions in certain sectors like creative arts, rice, textiles, cotton, meeting with some state governors on how to revamp the textile industries in the north, the palm oil estates in, in the south and southwest Nigeria, Edo Delta, and, and all the way down with rice and all of that. Uh, this development, finance, by the central bank seeking hundreds of billions of naira from Akoboro's program, which was uh, Emifile's uh, first shot into the uh, broader economy. So uh, do you think the, the, this policy has worked very well within the context of the fiscal space in which we found ourselves? Um, just as I said when I started in, you know, in my intervention, um, I think it's too soon to call. Um, so I, I understand, you know, uh, what uh, Mr. Booker said. I think I, 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 our opinion seems to have converged over the uh, past few years, calling on the uh, central bank to allow more, um, will I say, a more market-driven approach to economic policy making, rather than what I 
personally think is a more like a populist socialist um, you know approach to policy making because you call it development finance but i i see it as a, you know when they negotiate with states you know intervene directly in 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 particular businesses so one we see that as a way of government trying to win itself you know some kind of um, um you know uh, win has some mind so it should should the central bank be directly involved in such interventionist, socialist interventionist measures? I think that's the question that we need to ask. Of course, um, I don't want to go the full length of the hawkish uh, monetary policy theorists who would want to, you know, uh, be, uh, who want the central bank to really unleash the market, let the market work. But uh, it is important for us to understand that uh, in the economies where we see uh, monetary policy work efficiently, and then have been you know, in those places where they've been able to somehow manage the monetary trilemma uh, better, um, there is a more functioning of the market, you know, so the market has been allowed to take a shape. Now, um, you know, to substantiate that, you know, to buttress that point, you know, you see, um, finally, uh, the interest rate has been cut, uh, as you mentioned, you know, so 100 basis points. Uh, why is it coming now? Why didn't it come earlier? And then uh, we see that Naira is now because they are no longer in position to wage the, 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 what I think is always a losing battle against the Naira. So now they have no choice than to allow it to somehow fling to the market. So why, didn't, uh, why have they not allowed the Naira to, uh, you know, to somehow uh, find its uh, natural rate in the marketplace? Why not let the market you know, determine these rates? So if they had gone the way of the market, perhaps the intervention, the huge amount, billions of dollars, that they've used to intervene in the market in the past few years have used, you know, and return to other parts of the economy. So I think that is something that we need to be looking at. So um, in terms of making that decision, again, right now, when is, in fact, this is when we really need uh, government intervention, given the disruptions, given the constraints. I just came off from uh, the Lagos Business School Breakfast Club where Mezu Muneli, uh, a partner with Sahel, uh, you know, partners, we know Sahel partners, and their footprint all over Nigeria. So he was making the presentation regarding the impact of COVID-19 on the agricultural value chain. And okay, what we've seen is that there is very, you know, Nigeria is going to suffer uh, massively, you know, in terms of loss of supply. And then there are a lot of supply bottlenecks, okay? So uh, all those, th th this is the period when we actually needed to have the central bank begin to do what they did, they have been doing in, in the past few years. So now that we really need them, they are nowhere to be found. So uh, now it's now left to the market to really help out. But there's little, the market already has failed. And the government so has, ask, the government so is also uh, failed. Dr. Adi, so let's just ask uh, Philip Yusuf, who is the director in charge of uh, development finance at the Central Bank, uh, to answer the question you are pathetically putting forward in terms of what more, what do we expect from the Central Bank? Philip, um, uh, Mr. Yusuf, about the, your, from your department, and from the central bank, from Godwin the Mayfield led central bank, uh, we've seen the statements where from the COVID team in terms of interventions in healthcare, in pharmaceuticals, in hospitals, uh, and the research and, and all of that. So now we're talking about folks are saying the central bank should do a lot more. What do we expect to see moving forward, on, in particular under these new extenuating circumstances? in which the Central Bank of Nigeria found itself, and not just here, but around the world. Okay, thank you, uh, Boston. I, I, first, let me, let me respond to um, um, Dr. Bongo, who said um, earlier on that the impact is not being felt. And he talked about, um, you know, supply shock issues. If the governor had not taken the decision, you know, to um, bring up about the Ankobora program, you can imagine the food security issues we'll be having presently. Um, a couple of countries where we used to import rice from um, Thailand, Vietnam, have all locked their silos and they're, they're embarking on protectionist mechanisms, you know, not to allow um, exports of, of rice. But the decision, you know, four or five years ago to really fully domesticate the production of rice and other 10 commodities um, that, uh, you know, we consume on, on a daily basis is paying off. You know, you can imagine something as stable as rice. We're self-sustaining as we speak. We've been financing um, um, the Ankobora program over 700,000 farmers, each farming about um, two to three hectares. You can imagine the, the, the supply problems we'll, we'll have had. So that was a fantastic decision that we took earlier on. For the future, the, the governor has rolled out um, a, 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 a three-year 
short, mid, and long-term policy. On the short term, what the central bank is doing is focusing on MSMEs, who, who really are the lifeblood of the economy. You know, there's a 50 billion targeted facility at them. A lot of them have been drawing down that facility, you know, to ensure that, uh, you know, they continue their, their business. Also, because this is the pandemic, there's a, it's a healthcare crisis. There's a 100 billion naira uh, facility for um, the, the healthcare industries targeted at pharma, hospitals, and quite a, a lot of it has been approved. We, last week, we approved um, for um, some, some pharmaceutical companies who want to expand their lines for things like antibiotics, other ethical drugs, IV fluids, uh, and all that. And there's also focus going to be on housing, manufacturing. Uh, the governor has been having uh, meetings with the manufacturing sector. There's one trillion available for them. Um, there's also been, been drawn down since the, um, the, 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 the policy and, and the, the guidelines were, was rolled out. We've financed over 30 um, greenfield um, um, uh, projects. So there's one trillion on that. There's also the infraco. Um, there's 15 trillion that's going to be made available through uh, uh, an SPV to see how we can, um, um, you know, bring about the revitalization of infrastructure um, around the country. Housing is, is also a, a key focus for us. And lastly, R&D. Um, you, you realize that um, some weeks ago, the, the governor um, announced a grant for any of the institutions that can, you know, look at either a vaccine, either herbal medicine that can help, you know, to address um, the COVID issue. So there's, there's a guided policy response that is rolled out. And right from when the crisis started, you know, we had already done our scenario planning as a central bank. And the monetary policy um, meeting is just continuing to, to, to transmit that. So there's an oddly um, um, rollout of, uh, of, the, of the policies and the impact is already being felt. But for me, as, as, as the director of development and finance, the most important one, without food, you can't do any other thing. And the decision to have done the Anchor Boroughs program, which is a major you know, um, program of the President Buhari's uh, administration, is quite significant. You, know? you can really imagine, but just two days ago, the UAE announced, because they're beginning to, to feel the pressure of supply, they import about between 90 and 95% of their staple food products. They're looking at how they can begin to you know, um, cultivate rice in, in the desert. You know, they're just talking about it now. You know, because they're beginning to feel the impact from Vietnam and Thailand and other major exporters of, of food. You even remember Russia, you know, shot its um, borders. Wheat is one of their major exports. Mr. So Mr. while we're also looking at domestic demand as, yeah. as, Mr. Uh, as Mr. Mr. domestic Mr. demand. Mr. Yes, yeah. A few, a few questions have been raised about even the Arcos Borrowers Program that some farmers are not paying back the, this fund. What is the state of things right now with that? Uh, that, that's far from the truth. I, I mean, if you look at the rice pyramids that we, um, in the last uh, six months, that we have been um, going around the country, you know, and um, trying to um, show that indeed this program is working. I think the miscommunication and the misalignment is from the fact that you can either, we took a decision as, as a central bank, that you can either pay, you don't have to pay cash, because most of them do not have access to the market. So you can pay by produce, you know. So cash or produce, we, 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 most of the farmers prefer to pay by produce. So instead of taking it to the market, which is an additional cost, and go and sell, you know, bring back this money, give it into the bank or some other um, form of payment systems. We said, look, we're ready to take this produce. So quite a significant number of um, 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 the farmers are paying their loans. The only problem we have was in 2018, where there was a major flood um, um, around the whole country, if you remember, and a lot of the farmlands were washed out. And what we've done is to restructure um, those facilities, and a lot of them are going to be participating in the 2020 farming season. And because of the improved yields that we have, um, typically they will do four, to, for somebody who is doing rice, will do four to five um, 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 tons per hectare. And that will be enough for him to pay back the loan in 2018 that he took, and also the one that he's going to take in 2020. So there's significant um, recovery uh, that is ongoing. If you look at even the, the, the CTG, the cotton to garment, um, that we have uh, taken. Um, previously, what, what used to happen is we, the, the country used to throw money at the textile. So you throw money into a textile factory, you know, trying to revitalize it. Meanwhile, the cotton is not there or the lint is not there for <coughs> you to be able to turn, turn to garment. But what um, um, the governor has said is he prefers to look at it from a value chain perspective. So the cotton needs to be farmed. Uh, after it's farmed, we've worked on with the generis. We've uh, revitalized over 10 generis around the country. So the cotton that has been farmed in 2019 has been taken to the generis. They've been turned to lint. 
Um, now the lint is being taken to the textile. We're working with the textile. So they will spin it and then we'll now give it to um, the garment. We've already signed MOUs with the security agencies for them to be able to um, take the garment and turn them into uniforms. So that value chain perspective, looking at it from a value chain perspective is the best way to look at it. And, and it's worked um, over, over time for us. Same thing with rice. We, a couple of uh, millers have, have been mm -hmm. financed under our commercial agri-credit scheme. So the farmers farm, take the party to um, um, the, the, the millers who mill it. There's also a party aggregation scheme for those who, who want to finance buying the, the, the party from the farmers, take it to the millers who mill it and, and, and sell it as, as end product. So there's big success. Um, I reeled out the numbers earlier on with um, the anchor borrowers and other developmental um, um, interventions that um, we've been doing. Thank you, Mr. Yusuf. So Dr. Mahmoud, this is a new horizon. You're coming in from our FSS to so monetary policy. You're coming in at a time when there's a big storm globally. Uh, so what new monetary policy tools uh, will the central bank use moving forward as we look at the next four years of the um, Mifilis administration? Uh, would you be retooling or reshaping some of the existing monetary policy tools? Thank you. We will more or, more or less of sharpening. It's very difficult to develop new monetary policy tools because we've had a lot of criticism on on, on orthodox approaches, on conventional approaches. We we are we are working we are we are operating within a global environment, and we need to have the same standard with every other countries we are doing businesses or those we are doing businesses with are also doing businesses with other people. So it's a global environment. Everything is standardized. So we need to play within that sphere to be also very competitive. In, now we're in the period of crisis, and everybody knows in the period of crisis, conventional monetary policies to effectiveness become weak. So you need to have some innovations to be able to address some of this. And this is why you have all these stimulus packages, both fiscal and monetary, that you are plotting into it. And, and you also saw in the last uh, MPC that we did, decisions we took were principally to, to stimulate growth and get out us out of this COVID-19 uh, responses and the, the likely recession that every country in the world is, is looking at. So definitely we are going to be deploying such type of approaches to address significant issues in the economy. And like I said earlier, it is important, you know, what is the ultimate goal of monetary policy. It's not, it's not in isolation. It is, it is supposed to supplement every of the policies in the economy, financial, fiscal, external, towards this sustainable growth that we are looking at. Because in the end product is the people, how the, the development gets to the people. You can't be having high GDP growth, unemployment is high, poverty is high. No, no, it has to be inclusive growth. So you have to get, and that's why you see us deviating to other issues, financial inclusion, and all, all sorts of risk sector intervention, things that Gila just will down. Because we need to just get those things connected. The growth must be inclusive, must be, if not, not only positive, but must be an inclusive growth. That is job uh, job creating because we are looking for the effective demand to sustain the growth. So if you supply, you need people to pick those things from the shelf, and that supply chain continues, and that's how economies grow. Economy measured by the level of economic activities. So it is important that we, we, we keep that. So like I said, we know our weakest weakest links. We know the rigidities in the transmission channels. We know the bypasses to those rigidities in the transmission channels. We are going to smoothen that. To make sure that things, you know, flow normally through, you know, the appropriate uh, infrastructure we have in place, and, and we're seeing that in every every sector of the economy. So yes, definitely we'll sharpen those tools and we'll deploy other tools that will give us uh, effective results. Okay, uh, let, let me just uh, ask uh, Ali uh, in Nairobi. I'm sure you've listened uh, to this extensive uh, uh, back and front with these uh, two. Uh, directors of the central bank and, and other panelists. What's your take when it comes to a very critical conversation around interest rates, uh, inflation, and exchange rate, which goes to the value of the local currency, in particular for countries such as Nigeria that depends on petrol dollars for the, the lion's share of its revenue, and the right interest rates, uh, monetary policy tools and actions needed by the central bank to manage it for a country of 200 million people that is called Nigeria? The first thing was it's been a fascinating conversation to listen to. And what I'm hearing from it is that there's been a deliberate effort 
to diversify Nigeria, to reduce dependency, um, which is very far-sighted because as uh, my colleague was saying, uh, just look at the UAE, you've got this increasing sense that we've got to localize more production, regionalize it. So I think that was very far-sighted. And I think the you know, the, for every African country, I think it's key we can feed our people. And if you're not feeding your people, I think you are failing in terms of the national interest. I think those were really, really good uh, ideas. And it's really pleasing as an African to hear that you've made so much progress in that regard from what I could hear. Now, with respect to Nigeria, it's a problem about dependency on one commodity. That is what hmm. the real problem is, right? In essence, is if we're, going to, if we're going to diagnose the patient, we've got to say the lesson we're learning is that there is far too much dependency on the price of crude oil. I mean, fortunately, we've seen a tremendous recovery in the price which I would not continue to bet, uh, bet on, and I would urge the authorities to be looking at hedging strategies so that they don't fall victim to such a price or precipitous price fall. I remember having lots of discussions with different governments. Nobody on our continent is hedging. This is the way to lock in, protect ourselves against these kinds of price movements we might see. So I would be urging your people Look at it now. It's been a great rebound. Don't sit there and play in the casino. Take some money off the table. In terms of the FX strategy, just finally, I think ultimately, I was very interested in hearing uh, the thesis behind the strategy because for me, I'm more of a purist. I frankly believe that you, know, you take pain, but once you've got a, a, a market-driven foreign exchange rate, um, and you, you will actually benefit. And I'll give you the example of Egypt. They devalued their currency quite dramatically a few years ago. And look at the GDP growth rate, even now, that's come out of that devaluation. It's cathartic, it's painful, it's not pleasant. But at the end of the day, you're going to get people who are going to back Nigeria with a lot more money than they are backing, backing it with, with now. And I think Overall, it will be a positive catalyst for the economy. So I would say, I, 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 you know, notwithstanding the fact that I'm a purist on the FX management side, I was very interested in what I was hearing. So I think in the mix, I would just give my final takeaway, is I think the central banker has been extremely true, played a very, very difficult hand extremely well. But I think this is also an opportunity now for Nigeria to look ahead. Because when you're under pressure is when you can make tough decisions. And I would urge everybody, make those decisions because you're talking about hundreds of millions of people here whose interests you've got at heart. Uh, Ali, uh, Kenya is also yes. moving ahead with uh, crude oil exploration, licensing rounds, and all of that. So. It looks like whichever way you look at it, oil is still crude oil is still very sweet. So, so in Kenya's case, uh, Boas, when I would say that we were marginal crude oil producers. We needed a high oil price, and therefore, just like the shale boys have been uh, to some extent uh, reduced in the marketplace, I think Kenya is a victim of this oil price reduction. And I would say, if I was a betting man, I'm not betting on that oil coming on tap for the foreseeable future. It's not big enough. Um, it, the price is not right. Market conditions have changed. And I think, you know, that's the nature of the market. So I, for one, think Kenya has to forget about that. And uh, Kenya, of course, has benefited from the low oil price. We don't experience it at the pump because of the tax. 50% uh, of the price is taxed. But... Um, overall, one of the reasons the shilling has been quite stable is the lower oil price. Oh, great, Ali. So let's get back to Godwin Emefele, uh, Bungoari, uh, the Lagos Business School. Um, we've seen relationships sometimes between uh, a president and a central bank governor not being as uh, cozy as it should be uh, between U.S. President Donald Trump and the current uh, uh, federal uh, uh, 
uh, Fed chairman, even the, the, the immediate past, uh, um, uh, Janet Yellen. So, uh, so in terms of, do you think Nigeria's central bank governor has been too much of the same page with the administration, with the executive branch, and with the legislature when it comes to its policy footprints over the last six years? What do you make of this? Well, okay, so if we go back, um, let's just uh, keep America by the side. So let's look at our own experience in Nigeria. So if we go back uh, history learn, um, we remember during the time of um, um, uh, Soludo, okay, so uh, I remember a couple of, um, you know, physicals that he had to undergo with the government of the day. And then uh, we bring that down to, um, uh, to Sanusi era as well. So we know that uh, even Sanusi during Jonathan's, you know, raised um, uh, some dust, you know, so it wasn't a very cozy relationship. Now, um, coming down to MFLA in the past six years, so he has um, actually worked, uh, you know, he's been in somehow in very good uh, terms with the government of the day, so we've not experienced any sort of tension uh, between the two institutions. So in, in, in that way, so you can see that it's something that goes against our own historical experience. So it could also be that, uh, well, if he's doing well and the government of the day, you know, sees him as uh, doing well, there is no need to have any problems. So that's the way I would look at that. But at the same time, you will also see that um, he seems to be implementing, uh, like I said earlier, the populist, the socialist um, mandate that seems to be the preoccupation of the federal government. Um, looking at the 60-something uh, page uh, report of the uh, five years of the president, so what you notice there, actually, uh, because I was on, on air yesterday, in fact, I've been on air for a couple of days now on this particular issue reviewing uh, Buharinomics in the past five years. So what you experience is that the government has done well when it comes to what I again call socialist policies. Um, but um, just as I mentioned, um, we need to realize that it's, it's creating the bad incentive, a perverse incentive of a sort. It's just like when we had the AMCON, okay? So because we've had AMCON, we thought that AMCON would take up the bad loans and all of that, the toxic assets of the financial institutions, clean them up and then restore them and then it's it. But then we still see AMCON around today, which means it creates a kind of a moral hazard where people, mm -hmm. institutions, knowing that Hamcon is there to the rescue. So they will not exercise the, due, uh, the prudence that they should uh, normally have. And, and so we see that in the economy. So when the central bank becomes, uh, what I call it the Leviathan, you know, some, the, the super sovereign who dispenses funds directly to who needs it, that actually uh, hampers, uh, uh, you know, uh, neutralizes the market forces. The market force is what I know that, um, you know, instills the right uh, set of discipline. Yes, I have heard that we, you know, our own context is so unconventional, so we can use those, un I mean, uh, you know, uh, theoretical un uh, um, uh, recommendations and so on. But we need to understand that there are principles that are, you know, uh, irrefutable, which is that the market is the best way to organize economic activities. So if we want things to really work, create the right incentives, we need to empower them to work. And I think that is what is really lacking. Uh, because uh, the mandate of the uh, current uh, uh, government in Nigeria seems to be very socialist and populist, and I think uh, the CBN in the past six years seems to have danced to that tone. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Bungo uh, 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 Mr. Kerry Booker, you have about uh, two minutes to give us your, your thoughts about the, the next four years of uh, government mayfully at the central bank. What are your thoughts? Um, I, I believe the, practice, um, the, the, the next four years, Mr. Emefele need to actually look at some of the uh, conversations that we've had here. One is basically the fact that a market-driven or a market, um, uh, a realistic, fair, transparent, market-driven uh, monetary policy or posture would actually bode very well uh, for the young entrepreneurs in the economy that are looking at starting up, creating jobs uh, uh, by virtue of their innovativeness. Because the most important kinds of jobs that we need for the future are what I would call market-creating innovations. 
uh, which basically are the kinds of in, um, catalytic uh, uh, tools that need to be put in place to have immense uh, production or rather, uh, you know, bringing in things that would create more and more uh, jobs. Uh, the the low-hanging fruits of attacking agri is there. That can actually be used uh, as uh, the platform to do other things. But on all other aspects, uh, including the FX rates, one need to face uh, something that is more market driven rather than anything else. Now, the case that was highlighted by Ali uh, from Kenya is that of Egypt. And I have actu actually used that example uh, over and over again. In 2016, I believe, November 2016, uh, when we were faced with similar situation, Egypt decided to go with the IMF uh, program. And uh, since then, inflation rates have come down in Egypt to low single digits. Uh, FDI, uh, foreign direct investments, have increased, uh, I believe, about tenfold or something like that. Uh, and therefore, the issues, so the buffers that they have created, of course, there was a drastic uh, uh, devaluation at that time. But when you look at the currency strength vis-a-vis -vis Nigerian, the Naira now, the Egyptian pound and the Naira, you would discover that they actually are more stronger over the last uh, four, so, four or so years. Therefore, the route or the path they took was much more redeeming than the path we took. Uh, and of course, naturally, it is time to look at those and see what else we can do because our balance sheet is shrinking, both that of the central bank as well as that of the fiscal space. There is no enough fiscal space to do some of the things that we were prescribing earlier. Uh, and therefore, uh, we have to be extremely creative and embrace, uh, if it is bitter pills, embrace that and go with it. Thank you, uh, Buka Kiari. Uh, Dr. Mahmoud, uh, I'm sure you've listened to Obuka uh, in, in, around the spread, but again, you were coming through from the FSS. The last monetary policy committee meeting of just a few days ago, the central bank governor spoke about the resilience of the banking sector. So speak to us about uh, the state of the financial system uh, as we move into the next four years of Godwin Emefile at the central bank of Nigeria. Thank you. Um, you, you know, the, the financial system before 2014, we know how it came out of the crisis and how the system was a bit fragile and the state of the financial system. <laughs> but the best way to appraise the financial system is to look at the financial soundness indicators and what are those numbers showing now as of today. Critical among that is the capital adequacy ratio, the power muscle of, of, the, of the commercial bank to finance businesses to do their financial intermediation, to play their financial intermediation role and be catalyst for economic growth. Those, we, we, we have the Basel threshold, 8%. Nigeria is doing 10% for, for general, for, for the national banks. But for the systemically important banks, we had a threshold of 15%, which is a more prudent or more stringent you know, uh, regulatory threshold that we set for ourselves, particularly for the economy. And the banks are doing above that 15%, even as of today that I speak. So that means the banks have that financial muscle to withstand any shock or losses that may come into the, into, into the system. Another, another parameter we look at there is the, the, the liquidness or the, the liquidity of the financial system. What, what is the liquidity ratio? What is the ability of commercial banks or the banks in general to meet their short-term obligations? Because that's what keeps confidence in the financial system. And that will also have a threshold of 50, 30%. Many, many banks, the industry, the industry average is above 40%. So if that, that is the enough limit to drive the, the economy. And that is why we also came out with the LTR, with the initiative. Uh, so Kiari was talking about, you know, of this argument still on this conventional, on conventional tools. There are three principal mandates of the central bank. Price and monetary stability. Exchange rate stability because we are a small open, uh, open economy. And then you also now look at other developmental initiatives which, which uh, Yila has talked about. If you use that scorecard, we will have a pass in each of that. 
So anybody that will appraise the governor of Central Bank will say, these are your mandates, these are your objectives. How did you score in those places? What is the inflation rate? Has it been stable? Don't forget that. The biggest component of our exchange is food prices. Mm. We don't have control over food prices. It's exogenous to Central Bank and the Central Bank tools. However, the initiatives we are taking at the developmental side is for this production of food to come up so that we have enough supply. When there's enough supply, the prices will come down. That will hit inflation numbers immediately. And so those are those those are the things I, I kept early and saying earlier. That you have to understand the, the structure of your economy and you look at that. Then the second bucket is the is the exchange rate. Is that been stable? You have different pockets. Are they are different uh, windows? Are they converging? And, and how stable is your exchange rate? How do you see the level of capital reverses or outflows? Because what makes people move out of your economy is when they start seeing fears of your exchange rate or your mm. reserve is going down or your, 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 your reserve cannot cover more than three months' uh, import. So they start having that loss of confidence in the economy. And those are critical. Those are the real distortions that you know, collapse an economy. So if you sit down and say, okay, let market forces do this, the supply is not there. So which market forces are you talking about? Demand and supply. One side of the market is, is killed. So you need to bring in some, I'm sure uh, Mr. Kerry will appreciate this, this argument I'm doing, because that is just the reality of, 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 of the system. The, the last part of it is the, the returns, the profitability of the financial institutions. Mm. Going back to your boss's question, uh, this the profitability of the banking institution. What is the return of asset? What is the return of equity? Equity is what builds the system, what brings in the buffer for the banks to finance businesses. What is those results? They are positive. And if they are positive, that is the, the banking system is a going business. So the banking system is sound, it's safe. So people, and, that, and that is the catalyst for the economy. So that's what is going to provide the resources you need to drive your economy. We are talking that we want to shorten these foreign finances and stuff. But you need to grow your own domestic banks to be able to finance these big-time businesses. You see banks doing syndicate loan, five, six banks before they can give loan to them with it to, to run a refinery. In other economies, one bank can face that. So we need to, to, but before we build to that level, we need to do these fundamentals in the house and then be able to, you know, meet uh, what uh, Dr. Bongo was talking about. That yes, it's not on but we must follow the theoretical background. Everything we do is based on that fundamentals to achieve the ultimate goal. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Uh, Mahmoud. Uh, Mr. Philip uh, Yusuf, uh, so I have this question. The, the central bank is spending money left, right, and center intervening. So, Philip, the, my question to you is this. Is, is Godwin and Mayfile and the central bank printing money? Where is it find this money to fund this expansive development uh, 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 agenda that is being pursued left, right, and center? Now, Mr. Mayfile and, and, and the rest of you at the central bank are adding healthcare, pharmaceuticals, research, and, and manufacturing one trillion naira. How are you funding this? Where's the money coming from? Through the printing press or what? Or what source? <laughs> uh, there's no printing press in the central bank. But <laughs> we, have, we have various monetary policy mechanisms that we use. And one of them is uh, the cash reserve ratio. As we are aware, um, um, we have about, um, you know, almost... Um, 10 trillion that has been sterilized, uh, you know, to control supply of money. So there, there's what you call the discretionary cash reserve ratio. Um, we have a real sector support facility that we um, have um, come about. We've developed um, working with the, with the bankers committee and um, the other players in the sector. So we finance um, um, these um, um, incentives or these um, interventions through that um, support mechanism. So I'll give you an example. The healthcare, which is 100 billion, it's actually um, the bank's money is, is financed through um, um, the, the, the commercial banks. Um, it's 100 billion. So they, they, they take the, the, the risk. They do a, the credit appraisal. They send it to us and we look at it and then we, we, we approve. The, the principal concern of, um, of the governor is around, you know, how many jobs are being created, uh, you know, how much FX is being saved. Um, and then we also monitor to ensure that um, you know, these monies are properly utilized. And indeed, the purpose that have been set out um, um, in, in, in the guidelines are, are being followed. So there's, there's nothing about printing money. It's actually uh, monetary policy uh, interventions. And we're using the various mechanisms that are, that are available. 
Another one that um, you know you probably know about the SMEs is the AXMIS, which is um, an uncollateralized loan, which is given to um, young entrepreneurs, you know, to start a business. The maximum amount is about 10 million naira. Um, all you need to do is go through the National Microfinance Bank. And that money is also coming from the banks. Every bank sets aside 5% of its profit after tax into a fund. That fund is about 100 billion. It's, it's um, being managed um, on their behalf by the central bank. And it's driven through the National Microfinance Bank. So when you talk about printing money, there's no printing press here. There are various monetary policy mechanisms that we use, you know, to create this intervention. Mr. And, Mr. Yusuf, Mr. Yusuf I, was, I was looking at that very little uh, box uh, next uh, behind you there in the office just down there. So you can just look, I thought that was a printing machine uh, uh, that prints money. Like uh, a printing machine. Yeah, you know, it looks like a printing machine. I don't know the size, but, but okay. Uh, thank you. So, <laughs> last one, Yusuf, okay, very clear. quickly. Where are we with Infraco? Yeah. Where are we with Infraco PLC? What's the latest on that? Just in one minute or less, so that we we'll wrap up the program. Oh, yeah. Uh, thanks, Boston. A lot of work is being done. A lot of um, we're talking to all the stakeholders. Um, we are uh, looking at the concept. The various concept papers have been brought about. We're looking at it, and um, the governor has set up a team that um, is going to be um, rolling that out. So, and then there. In the coming weeks, you should um, hear from the, um, the various players about the structure and how it's um, going to run. A lot of work is being done um, internally. And that in the coming weeks, you, you, will, you will see the outcome of that. We're looking forward to how that can you know, change the dynamics of how we can finance infrastructure with um, local currency, with Naira, and um, you know, take it to um, um, another level. So in the coming weeks, you will definitely um, see some, um, some work from that area. Okay, thank you, gentlemen. I'm going to give Ali the final 30 seconds of this special edition programming. Ali, what are your closing thoughts? Well, my thoughts were, you know, we're obviously dealing with a unique phenomena. This is the virus still has not been resolved. And I think, you know, therefore, when we're looking at typical economics, we've got to be wary of just trying to stimulate demand, which is depressed. And I think we're far better off looking at uh, autarkic economy. How do we make ourselves more self-sufficient and tool our African countries? And I think the first priority is our ability to feed our citizens. And I think that's where we can start from. And it was great to hear about the efforts that you've put in on your side of the continent to do as, uh, exactly that. My final point is it's a fiendishly complicated world we're living in. And really, I wish everybody the best of, the best of luck in these tough times. Thank you so much. Uh, Ali Kansaji, CEO and founder of Rich Frontiers Management in Nairobi. Thank you so much for being on this special uh, programming. Six years uh, of uh, Godwin and Mayfield as the Central Bank Governor. Philip Gila Yusuf, the uh, Director in Charge of uh, Development Finance at the Central Bank. Thank you very much. We appreciate your time. It's a business day. Uh, thank you for this it's about an hour and a 15 minutes conversation. Dr. Hassan uh, Mahmoud. Uh, Director in Charge of Voluntary Policy at the Central Bank of Nigeria. Thank you very much for your time and your thoughts on the sixth anniversary of the Central Bank Governor Emefele. Thank you so much. Gary Booker, a Chairman of Sunu Assurance PLC, and a former uh, Chairman of the Nigeria Economic Summit Group. Thank you very much. We appreciate your time. And Dr. Bukwadi, uh, a Senior Faculty of Economics at the Lagos Business School. Thank you very much, everyone. Have a great day. And of course, we mark the sixth anniversary of the Central Bank Governor uh, uh, Godwin Emifele are uh, here on Frontier Africa Report. Thank you, our viewers here in Nigeria and around the world. I am Bustin Amofayi, and I'll see you next time. Have a good day, everyone. Thank you.